What's up you filthy heretics, how you doing? My name is Asmagon and I welcome you back to my channel. Today I'll be talking about another of the Emperor's mighty sons, Horus Lupercal. Knowing all of you no doubt find yourselves eager to jump into this one, let's get right into the lore dump. Like his brothers, Horus was swished across the galaxy by the Chaos Gods in an attempt to hinder the Emperor's plans. It's the same song and dance we've had with all the Primarchs I've covered thus far, and, spoilers, it's going to be in the rest of their videos too. Anyway, Horus would arrive upon the planet of Chthonia, where his upbringing is virtually unknown. What is clear from this time is that Chthonia itself was a planet once rife with natural resources and had prospered due to this. However, over the many long years of separation from the wider human entities in the galaxy and internal strife had led to these resources being virtually used up on the planet. Therefore, Horus would arrive not on a planet prospering, but on a planet of gangers and thugs. Horus would soon adapt to his environment and grow up absorbing parts of the culture around him, said culture being that of violent brutish thugs, but hey, it could always be worse, especially in this universe. Count your lucky stars, Horus. Even more especially since unlike the vast majority of other Primarchs, Horus wasn't fully raised by these gangers and thugs, for he was soon retrieved by the Emperor and raised up by the man himself pretty much primarily. However, this is just one possible account for Horus's early years, so take it with a grain of salt. It's just the one I'm rolling with, with the information that I have to go off of. Anyway, Horus was, for the longest time, the Emperor's only son and would formulate a strong bond with his father, learning many things in the areas of diplomacy, battle tactics, and leadership. You could say the two were as thick as thieves. Starting the tradition off good and early, Horus was given the reins of his own Legion of Sons, the 16th Legion of Space Marines, which had already come to be known as the Luna Wolves, and for some 30 odd years it would be just the Emperor and Horus leading the Great Crusade. As Horus had learned directly from the Emperor himself and had some 30 odd years of experience under his belt, the steadily recruited other Primarchs came to revere Horus as the wisest and strongest of them, often looking to him as the supreme example to which they must build themselves up to. One thing to note about Horus which would serve as his greatest strength, but would also be the key to his eventual downfall, is his mastery over human psychology. Horus was famed for bringing human worlds to heal under the Imperium's banners, simply by exercising those worlds' traditions and being able to instantly recognize someone's greatest strengths and crippling weaknesses. Almost at a glance, Horus was truly far more than a mere warrior, he was also a master of the mind as well. To jump ahead many years, the Emperor declared that he was leaving the Great Crusade to refocus his efforts onto a great task. Said task the Emperor would not elaborate upon and merely pushed aside by naming Horus the new War Master of the Great Crusade, and therefore making Horus second only to himself. A truly poor decision in hindsight, but it definitely made sense in the moment. Horus was initially apprehensive at his promotion, but took the honor upon himself all the same. Horus would immediately convene with his brothers, desiring to resolve any ill feelings at this turn of events from the outset. The best way to handle it, if you ask me. Horus in one foul swoop was able to calm the crybaby's Angron and Potorabo, who objected to his appointment as War Master. He was already being cheered into office by Sanguinius Fulgrim and Lorgar, and he was met with contented respect and acceptance from Rogel Dorn, Gurlyman, and Jagatai Khan, whom he respected most and sought advice from above all of his brothers. Despite this celebratory occasion, Horus's mind was far from content or joyful. Though the Emperor had delivered the news as some mighty achievement and success, Horus didn't see it that way. The Emperor had abandoned himself and his brothers to retreat back to Terra, and didn't even bother to tell his own generals what he could possibly be doing that was so important. Surely at least he, Horus, was trustworthy enough to be given the explanation. No. The Emperor may have made a big spectacle, but in reality he had merely given Horus his dirty work. The Emperor would get to sit back comfortably on Terra, while he, Horus, would be winning the Emperor's Imperium for him. This would be the moment in which Horus's mental armor would find a chink formed at its heart. Side note, after a pep talk from Sanguinius, Horus decided to rename his legion to the Sons of Horus, which the Emperor had recommended after naming him War Master. I decided to include this detail to stress how much Sanguinius was a bro to his bros, and to reflect why he meant so much to the majority of them. Well, heretics, that marks the end of the first half 
of Horace's story. That's right, it's a two-parter! I could have fit Horace's story into a single video, however, considering his significance to 40k as a whole, and how much of a universe-redefining man he was, I feel it necessary to award him a two-part breakdown. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. My name is Asmagon, and I look forward to unveiling the second half of Horace's story in part two. Looking forward to that next week, and remember, for the Imperium, my brothers.